Hi everyone. Welcome you all to the another interesting episode of Retina Roundup. Moving on to our first interesting article which dealt with the anomalies of choroidal venous structure in high myope eyes. It was done using a wide field ICG images of 175 high myope eyes and 100 control eyes and there was no significant difference in the age and the gender between the high myo patient and the control group. However, the three types of changes of large choroidal veins were found in 58.86% of the high myo, out of which the asymmetry of the vortex vein in 25%, isolated long vein across the macula in 33%, and the intervortex anastomosis in 14% of the eyes. The similar changes in controls were significantly lower than those in the high myo group. And this pattern of asymmetry were affected by the stiffer staphyloma edges and the anastomosis were absorbed through the larger trunk and the terminal venules. And this study concluded that choroidal venous anomalies are more common in high myopes than the control and the choroidal venous structure in high myopies may underlie the development of the myopic maculopathy. Moving on to a second interesting article which talk about the sausaging and the bulbosities of the choroidal vein in central serous chorioretinopathy. This study also uses the wide field ICG of the eyes with CSE where graded for the sausaging and bullosity. The sausaging is defined as a three or more contiguous fusiform dilation that vary by at least a 50% from the narrowest to the largest diameter. And the bulbosities is defined as a focal 2x dilatation of the blood vessel as compared with the diameter of the surrounding host vessel. 73 eyes of 41 patients were studied. The sausaging of the vessels were seen in a mean and a median of 3 quadrant per eye and the only significant risk factor for sausaging was the use of corticosteroids and the two significant predictors of subfoveal choroidal thickness were age and the proportion of the quadrants that is involved by sausaging. And this study concluded that Variation in the venous caliber seems to be associated with the pathophysiologic alteration related to the increased pressure within and the remodeling of these larger choroidal plates. And this may lead to the overloading of the choreocapillaries with leakage as one manifestation. Moving on to our next interesting article. It is the controversial topic, the treatment methods for submacular hemorrhage in neovascular AMD whether to treat conservative versus the active surgical strategy. The 236 patients with submacular hemorrhage were stratified into four groups. The first group is an observation group. And the second group being the anti of monotherapy. The third group is a non-surgical gas tamponade group. And the fourth group is a subretinal surgery group. And the primary outcome was a BCBA at 12 months. And the anti of monotherapy group showed a better mean BCBA significantly at three months. And the only baseline BCBA was associated with the visual acuity gain at 12 months. And this study demonstrated that there was no difference in 12 months visual outcome among the treatment and the better the earlier visual outcome can be expected with the anti of monotherapy. Moving on to our next interesting article, which dealt with the association between the age-related macular degeneration and the sleep dysfunction. ARMD is a prevalent degenerative retinal disease it is associated with a non-visual and the psychosocial impairment that may affect the sleep. And the study is evaluating the association between the AMD and the sleep that includes the sleep disorders like insomnia and the sleep apnea and the vice versa were included. The four studies found that AMD was associated with the increased rates of sleep apnea and the sleep quality. While the five studies showed that patients with sleep apnea or the insomnia were at higher risk of developing the AMD. And this study concluded that only a limited number of studies investigated the association between the AMD and the sleep. And these studies suggest a bidirectional relationship between the AMD and the sleep dysfunction. And the additional studies using the objective characterization of the sleep in patients with AMD are required to confirm these findings. Moving on to our next interesting article, which dealt with the evaluation of the retinal hazard using a 3D digitally assisted visualization system and the conventional microscope in macular surgeries. The patient who underwent PPV for ERM using a 3D and a conventional microscope were included. The spectral irradiance of endo illuminators 
were measured for the representative setting that is used during the corvid and the macular manipulation with the 3D and the conventional microscope. From the medical record of the patients, the time that is needed for the corvid and the macular manipulations were extracted. And the total retinal light hazard index and the macular hazard index were calculated based on the spectral irradiance weighed by the standard function. And the number of cases that exceeded the maximum permissible radiant power exposure were compared between the two groups. The spectral irradiance were calculated for corvid and the macular manipulations for 3D and the conventional microscope group. The 5% of the PPV cases exceeded the threshold limit with 3D, whereas 60% were exceeded the threshold limit in conventional microscope group. And this study concludes that the 3D digitally assisted visualization system offers a significantly safer macular surgery compared to the conventional microscope, considering the potential retinal hazard. So moving on to our final article of this month, it's quite interesting. It is the fluorescent selectum imaging of thermoscopy as a predictor of long-term functional outcome in macula of RRD. FLIO is a nothing but an imaging modality of in vivo measurement of lifetimes of endogenous retinal fluorophores. The patients with pseudophagic macula of RRD were included. This FLIO in the central ETDRS grid subfield in two distinct channels, that is short spectral channel and a long spectral channel. And the BCV and the fluorescence lifetimes were compared between the first month and the sixth month. And the OCT matrix were calculated with the fluorescence lifetime data. 19 patients were analyzed, out of which the lifetime of the previously detached retina were prolonged compared to the healthy fellow eyes. The short lifetime at one month were associated with the better BCBA improvement and with the good final BCBA. The lifetimes were prolonged in some cases of outer retinal damage in OCT scans. And this study concludes that FLIO might serve as a prediction tool for functional recovery in pseudophagic macula of RRD. And the retinal fluorescence lifetimes could give a insight in the molecular process after RRD. This was all for this month. See you all next month with five new interesting articles. Bye-bye.